It is my extremely great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. Uh, Dr. Nima Arkani Hamed is a professor in the School of Natural Sciences at the Institute of Advanced Study at Princeton. I am actually looking at my notes while I give this introduction because I just had to rewrite it because of something pretty extraordinary that got announced today. Um, he's one of the leading particle physics phenomenologists of his generation, uh, concerned with the relation between theory and experiment. His research has shown uh, how the extreme weakness of gravity relative to the forces of nature might be explained by the existence of extra dimensions of space and how the structure of comparatively low energy physics is constrained within the context of string theory. He's taken the lead in proposing new physics to be, theories to be tested at the LHC at CERN. Well, very timely uh, talk this summer. Uh, he's appeared on TV and in newspapers. Back when he was just, you know, at Harvard Place, he got the Phi Beta Kappa Teaching Award. Um, he's won many awards and recognitions in physics, as you can see in your program. I don't want to take the time away from this talk to introduce all of those. But I would like to uh, mention, if you haven't read the newspaper today, that he received a $3 million prize announced today for fundamental physics. This prize was established by Yuri Milner, who, after a year of graduate school in physics, dropped out, went off to make a, a lot of money investing in the internet, in little things like Groupon and uh, Facebook. And so uh, I think we're, we're very fortunate to have such a good speaker here today. There were, again, nine physicists were chosen for that award, and we have one of them. So would you please? Join me in welcoming Dina. Well, it's a really a tremendous pleasure and uh, honor to be here. Um, uh, and it is indeed uh, a very interesting time uh, in our in our subject. Uh, um, uh, many, of, many of you have heard about all sorts of exciting things going on uh, at CERN, at the Large Hadron Collider. And uh, I want to tell you about that story, uh, but I'm going to tell it in a, perhaps in a somewhat different way than, um, uh, than, than, than would normally be given in similar talks. Um, I, I do want to put the sort of intellectual adventure that we're on in this business in some of its historical context so that, we can, that you can actually understand why it is we're doing what we're doing in the way we're doing it, uh, and exactly what it is that's been accomplished now and what we hope uh, to learn in the relatively near time scale, in, uh, by, in, in, in this decade, uh, about um, uh, this, this business of uh, fundamental physics. Um, so all of these things, remarkably, go back to some real, uh, first of all, uh, triumphs in our understanding of the way nature works that goes back to the beginning of the 20th century with the revolutions of relativity and quantum mechanics. Um, uh, these were incredible developments. Uh, the first half of the 20th century, much of the second half of the 20th century was uh, concerned with figuring out how to describe nature in a way that's compatible with these two basic pillars that were handed down to us from our intellectual ancestors uh, 80 years ago. Um, and uh, we figured out how to do that. We figured out how to describe physics in a way that was sort of consistent with these two basic principles. Um, and this turns out to be an incredibly constrained and rich and powerful theoretical structure that also works and describes the world. So, uh, so on the one hand, this is why this is such a wonderful time in, in, in physics. On the one hand, we have incredibly solid foundations on which to build. We're not we're not uh, you know, struggling in the dark completely. Uh, we have a good idea of the things we understand and the things that, uh, that are on the boundaries of what we understand. And therefore, we have a fairly good idea of where we need to go to push to push those boundaries forward. Uh, so it, it's really a, 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 it's, it, it's a remarkable time to be doing uh, physics. First of all, purely from a theoretical point of view, there's all sorts of wonderful developments if we understand things very well. But of course, Famously, we're also in an era of experiments again, finally in this business, after uh, 20 or 30 years when um, 
when theorists have been uh, uh, off ahead of the experimentalists wondering about what might happen, the era of speculation, at least for part of the kind of questions that we're talking about, is coming to an end, and we're starting to actually learn what the answers are. Uh, and that's what I want to give you a sense for. So uh, I have to start uh, giving you that uh, I promised to put this whole business in context. Um, uh, I have to start by reviewing the last 400 years of physics in 10 minutes. And um, by the way, uh, um, you'll notice the number 94 at the bottom of the slide for the number. Please don't freak out. <laughs> um, uh, it's not. It's not guaranteed that we'll get through all 94 slides. Um, <laughs> It depends on your patience and my <coughs> stamina. Uh, um, but uh, no, quite, quite seriously, uh, I'll, I'll try to cover a, a, a logically coherent chunk of the material. I'm around all day afterwards. Anyone who's interested, we can go through the rest of the slides uh, privately. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, okay. So let's start with the lightning review of the last 400 years. Um, and something you all know is that uh, there are four basic interactions that we know that govern uh, uh, basically all, all the laws of nature uh, that we know are associated with these four basic interactions. Gravity, um, uh, electromagnetism, which were familiar even to the ancients in one form or another, uh, as well as uh, uh, less familiar interactions that, that people discovered uh, in the very, very late 1800s and the early 1900s um, associated with the atomic nucleus. Uh, there was the weak interactions, which are ultimately responsible for radioactivity, uh, the reason why we have uh, radioactive nuclei and some nuclei disintegrate and so on, is that if you take a neutron, and you take a neutron and you just shove it in the middle of empty space, that neutron in around 15 minutes will disintegrate. It'll break apart into a proton, an electron, and something called an anti-electron neutrino. Uh, now, 15 minutes is an enormous time scale compared to all the sort of the microscopic time scales that you would associate with uh, uh, atoms and nuclei and so on, which is why this interaction is historically called weak. Anything that's so incredibly feeble that it takes a gargantuan 15 minutes to make a little neutron decay has got to be a very weak interaction. So that's why it was called weak. And there's something else called the strong interaction. Now, today we understand the strong interaction is fundamentally something else, something more primitive and basic. But its earliest incarnation, the earliest hint that there was something new beyond these interactions, uh, gravity, electromagnetic, nuclear interactions, was that something in the atomic nucleus had to be holding the protons together because their electric repulsion would want to just uh, would, would would want to uh, drive them apart. So something much stronger than the electric uh, force had to hold them together. Okay, so those are the four basic interactions that we know of, and these interactions uh, hold sway over an enormous range of distances. Now. Uh, I understand that Richard Gott gave you a spectacular talk about all the different distance scales, so I have to make an even bigger apology for this slide than I normally do. Uh, so, but, uh, look, I'm a physicist, I'm not an artist, okay? You're gonna have to live with these really horrible stick figures and everything for the rest of the talk, but uh, I hope the content makes up for it. Um, if not, please complain to me later, or maybe complain to my art teachers, who, uh, who, who could have done more with my non-existent talent when I was seven years old. Um, anyway, so these interactions hold over this enormous range of distances. This is really all the distance scales that we know about in nature today. The largest distance scales around 10 to the 28 centimeters, uh, around the size of the observable universe, called the Hubble scale. The smallest distance scales uh, that we uh, uh, well, that, we, that we're about to probe with experiment, we're probing with experiments right now uh, at the LHC, is around 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. Um, and actually, uh, it, it's fascinating that that distance scale isn't only interesting because it happens to be the experimental frontier of where we are today. It is the experimental frontier of where we are today. But we've actually known that there's something important going on at exactly this distance scale for around 70 or 80 years. Uh, even Fermi knew that something uh, was going on at around these distances. Uh, that something is going to be a topic of a lot of the rest of this talk, and, and it's wonderful that we're, we're finally uh, in, the, in that era where we're, 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 exper we're, we're experimentally probing this distance scale where we suspect that something has, has been going on for a long time. And in between, you know, every factor of 10, as you go down, something interesting happens. Uh, you know, galaxies are a million times smaller than the universe. Uh, the Earth-Sun distance is 10 to the 13 centimeters. 
Protons and neutrons skipping a bunch. Protons and neutrons are around 10 to the minus 14 centimeters big. So this system scale is around a thousand times smaller than the atomic nucleus. So there are all sorts of interesting things in between the Hubble scale and the weak scale. Most of science is about all those interesting things that are, that are out there. And it's absolutely fascinating and wonderful and important and fantastic stuff. Uh, but what we're interested in, in our particular part of physics, is a sort of cleaned up version of this picture. Also, first of all, again, here are the experimental frontiers, the LHC on the shortest distances, the various cosmological experiments on the longest distances. But let me clean up this picture a little bit. So these are the distance scales that we care about uh, in our part of physics. And actually, you'll notice that the entire previous slide is, uh, is uh, the weak scale and the Hubble scale. There's one more length scale that I've included here called the plot length, which I will uh, describe a little bit in a second. And these are really three very important, uh, it seems, very important fundamental distance scales in nature. And it's a little bit of a joke, a little bit of an, of an exaggeration, but if you work in this part of physics, especially as a theoretical physicist, you could wake up in the morning and say, gee, should I think about the Hubble scale today? Should I think about the Planck scale? Should I think about the weak scale? Uh, all of these, the, the physics of these radically different scales turn out, to, uh, turn out to be related to each other in very interesting ways. There are mysteries associated with all these distance scales that are related to each other in, in, in very interesting ways. And so one does spend most of one's time uh, obsessing about what's going on with these uh, uh, scales. Now, in fact, I can, I can tell you, um, we're going to spend uh, a number of minutes uh, talking about this fantastic structure that we have that explains the world so well, but just to foreshadow a little bit where, where we're going, uh, these distances are actually, these distance scales are also associated with the two essential paradoxes that face us today, two essential mysteries that face us today in trying to push physics forward beyond what we know already. One of them is associated with physics of these incredibly tiny distances, this Planck length 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. Uh, this is the distance scale, as I'll review in a second, where quantum mechanics and gravity both become important at the same time. It's the distance scale where, for many reasons, we suspect the whole notion of space and time break down and have to be replaced by something else. And if that sounds like a, like a, like a big radical step that needs to be made, it is a big radical step that needs to be made, and it's a very hard problem, and many people are thinking about it. Um, but, uh, but there's clearly some very, very important mystery going on at these truly, truly teeny, teeny, tiny distance scales. You'll notice that's around 17 orders of magnitude smaller than any distance scale that we're about to probe and experiment, which is stopping around there. Okay. That's one mystery that I'll, uh, I may spend some time talking about. There's a very different character mystery, which is that you'll notice that there's enormous dis differences between these different length scales. Right? Uh, Roughly speaking, we have the length scales of microscopic physics. It's 10 to the minus 17 centimeters, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters on the one hand. And we also have an enormous universe on the other hand. So we have a big macroscopic universe. Uh, while the underlying laws are, uh, you know, hold sway and are fundamentally described in very short distances. So there are these gigantic gaps. There's this huge difference between all these uh, uh, different scales. And it turns out to be, uh, it's not obvious ahead of time, you wouldn't think necessarily this is a profound question, but it turns out this is a very profound and difficult question. Why is there a macroscopic universe? Why when, why when the essential laws are uh, hold at tiny distances, and as, we'll, as we'll, we'll review, because of quantum mechanics, there are gigantic, very big, violent quantum mechanical fluctuations that are more and more violent at shorter and shorter distances. That seems to make it almost impossible to imagine that there was a nice, big, coherent, macroscopic universe, and yet here we are, living in a nice, big, coherent, macroscopic universe. Why is that? that? That turns out to be a question that we have a terrible answer for in our current understanding of things. So despite the fact that we have a spectacular understanding of, of so much else in exquisite quantitative detail that I'll rhapsodize about uh, for the next 10 minutes, uh, there are these two major paradoxes looming. Many of us suspect that addressing these questions are really going to be the sort of driving forces of the development of fundamental physics in the 21st century. 